Anybody brand new in their position? I'm curious to see who is like brand, brand new here too. So uh, a mega welcome to everybody that uh, that is showing up and just started in April. Yay. Awesome. Two weeks ago. Holy moly, Brooke. Welcome. June 1st. Look at this. Oh, yay. I'm so glad you all could come. Please tell if you've got friends or colleagues that are interested in something like this. Um, feel free to let them know that we will be uh, sending out some resources to you as well as the link. If you have other folks that are interested, feel free to pass it along, share the wealth, all that good stuff. Um, but as we are getting going here, I see it uh, one o'clock our time. We'll continue letting folks in. But Melissa, Jolene, should we get the ball rolling? Sure. All right. All right. Well, Again, welcome everybody. We are so excited you're here. Um, I guess just to do a quick welcome, um, Melissa, Jolene and I are, are all good friends uh, in the industry. And so our our hope here is, uh, is to pass along a little bit of knowledge, open up some lines of communication, heck, network, whatever you need to do in the chat. Um, but we are just so excited that you're here and uh, and hope that that you can gain a little bit from our program today. We've got a lot of things to cover and we wanted to be respectful of your time. And so um, we're definitely going to, to have time for questions and everything else. Uh, feel free to put that into the chat and all of that. Uh, but I will, oops, yeah, there we go. I've got to follow along in like eight different places. So um, <laughs> Melissa, why don't you start and uh, introduce yourself? Hi everyone, um, my name is Melissa Beer. I use she, her pronouns, and I own Rebel Events. I'm based out of St. Paul, Minnesota. And um, before I kind of get into things, I just want to honor the fact that Sue Jolene and I share a lot of um, visible and invisible identities that do give us a lot of privilege. So I want to let you all know that, I mean, even as business owners and things like that, that gives us a, a, a lot of freedom and choice to do what we do. Um, as white women living in middle America, that also um, makes some things for us easier than it would others. We want to honor that right at the top. Um, and we want this place to be um, one of constructive feedback and learning and growth. And so if at any opportunity, there is an opportunity for any of us to know better so that we can all do better, then that's the name of the game. So we want to welcome everyone here. Um, and Happy to take questions questions throughout and and spend our Tuesday afternoon together. Awesome. And uh, for everybody just joining, my name is Sue Boxrood. I also use she, her, her pronouns. And uh, I am with Bash Schuler Entertainment. Uh, and I am just thrilled to be here with you today. And Jolene, I promise I will do a better job on the slides. <laughs> you're good. You're good. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Jolene Chevalier. I also use she, her, hers pronouns. Uh, I am a middle agent based in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, Sue and Melissa are based in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. So we're basically all neighbors here in the Midwest. And um, some some just some things right off the bat that we want to start with to get us, you know, to get us started is that we have a lot of different folks here. I This is fun reading the chat. Some of you have been in your positions for two weeks. Some of you have been in your positions for many years and all are welcome. We're very excited for all of those different perspectives. We are all adults here. If anybody has to step out, use the restroom, do whatever you need to do. Go right ahead. Don't feel bad about that. Uh, we'll probably have to at some point take a break to do the same. So we also want this to be a very open environment where people feel free to ask questions, make comments, use the chat freely. We want everybody to um, join the conversation and feel free to have your camera on. If you need to you know, use the raise hand uh, emoji, whatever, uh, we want everybody to be involved in the conversation. So to start out with, um, just to kind of get a feel for who is in the, the room, we would like to ask, you know, what would a successful workshop look like to you today? What are some things you're hoping to get out of this? 
or what are just some burning questions you have right off the bat about planning events for your campus. We would love for folks to flood the chat with those just so we can kind of get a feel for who's here and, and what you're looking for, because ultimately we want to make sure we're serving the folks that are that are here and present today, um, but we'll be going over a lot of different information. And I have another prompt too, in case you're still thinking about questions. Another thing we want to talk about, you know, we're going to, we're going to talk about um, how to get some wins this up, upcoming academic year, but we would love to hear from you. What are, uh, does anybody have a couple of successful wins from this year? Are there any programs that you did were, that were just a huge win this academic year? We'd love to hear those as well. Oh, good. It looks like some folks are looking for new ideas, popular events, cost-effective events, looking for resources, having a clear roadmap. Yep. Being able to talk. Networking. Oh, laser tag was really successful. Great. Interactive. A lot Special of people. Special are a big hit in my house too. <laughs> yep. 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 Absolutely. These are Engagement. all great. programming for diverse campus bodies. Love it. Hi, Jillian. Oh. <laughs> Love it. Wonderful. Well, these are all fantastic. Uh, really yeah. exciting to, yeah, keep them coming. This is so great. Um, dodgeball tournament. That sounds amazing today. Star Wars Day. Oh, Kathy, my daughter's born on 5-4, so she, uh, this, it's strong. The, the is, force is strong with that one. It's real strong. <laughs> oh, Bob Ross painting parties in here. Okay, great things. Yeah, very cool. DIY sweater. Okay, we're going to have to hear more about that. Water your garden say what oh good nice okay very cool excellent and i like kathy what you're talking about too with the programming with others in mind too you know spreading the love and making sure that you're uh working with other groups on campus and everything else that's fantastic uh melissa you ready to start us off yes i was furiously reading the chat uh sorry <laughs> so I, I think I'm up, up to speed. Um, thrilled to, to, to be here today. Um, great to see some of you that I know and looking forward to meeting some of you that I don't. Um, wanted to begin the conversation um, about discussing wants, needs, and boundaries. Now, um, I'm going to start at the bottom of the slide actually and go to boundaries since those are things that are not negotiable, we can't move those, right? All of this information I could talk about for a solid day. So please know that I am going to squish it into a couple of minutes. And if you have follow-up questions, you can throw them in the chat. You can direct message me, however you feel comfortable. Uh, I'd also like to say that just personally, this is something I've noodled on a lot. Oh, my dog's visiting. <laughs> noodled on a lot. So if there's something, um, Again, that you want to talk about more offline about process and things like that. I'm, I'm always, I love, I'm here for those conversations all the time. So boundaries, um, you, you really want to do this um, and encourage, if you're an advisor, um, you want to encourage your students to know all of this beforehand, right? This is, this is information that applies to any type of program that you're doing, whether or not it's bingo, dodgeball, or your Spring Fest concert. It applies to all of them. You need to understand um, what your um, university or institution's purpose is, what their mission is. Um, are you a, a Jesuit institution? Um, are you located in a place that has different laws than other folks, you need to really understand and, and have a, a, a meeting with your entire team um, identifying what those boundaries are, okay? Some of it might even include paperwork. Paperwork can be a boundary, not necessarily meaning like 
do not cross, but more um, we need to be able to provide this information. So if you need insurance, I consider that a boundary. Well, I, I haven't met anybody in a while that doesn't carry insurance policies. It's important to let people know that you need that. That's a boundary that you know on top that again, whether you're not, you're doing bingo or spring fest and everything in between, all of that applies, right? So sometimes our budgets are boundaries. Um, they don't have to be, um, but sometimes they are. That is definitely um, one of those kind of details that floats between a boundary and a need, okay? So let's move to the next category of need. So need can be, we need to program 50 events a year, right? So maybe that's the need get cracking. Um, maybe the need is we need one act to make us all look like rock stars for family weekend. That's your need, right? That will that will include a, a different set of boundaries with regards to dates and budgets and things like that. Um, but knowing very specifically what your purpose is and what your goal is, is important. Perhaps a need is we need to include um, a different group of students on campus, or we need to target a different audience for this particular event. That's a need and should instantly be prioritized to the top of the list when you're, you're shopping and you're making choices. Now, once you have a clear grasp of your boundaries that never change and your needs that will change, you can or your students can um, move forward and feel very empowered to have conversations with folks like Sue, myself, and Jolene, um, or even just shop on their own to bring kind of some of their best ideas to the table. I always really encourage everyone to understand that doing this work and doing the work of identifying your wants, needs, and boundaries allows, it, it feels like a lot it can feel like quite a, a daunting process to really identify all those things, but it saves you loads of time forever and always moving forward, okay? So by, by empowering students, especially if, if you're looking to delegate tasks along the way, to, to understand the process enough to pick up the phone or, or send an email to say, I'm looking something looking for something for family weekend. I have $2,500. It has to be on September 22nd. Um, we are a Jesuit institution, so I have to steer away from this content. What do you have? Not only does it allow you to have that quick and efficient conversation, but it also allows you to really spend the time exploring the wants. And that's always the fun part, right? <laughs> that's always, uh, I want to put my mark on this. I want my personality, my flair, my values to shine through. This is something that I really want to make mine. Um, maybe it's creating a new tradition on campus. Maybe it's bringing something from your culture to campus that can be really, really, really pegged to, gosh, you know who did a bang up job? Was that Jolene? However many years ago, something to be remembered. And so I always really encourage you to begin any conversation with those needs, wants, and boundaries. That will help us determine success. It will help us identify goals. And it will also help us by truly understanding our missions and visions. It will help us sell this to our bosses, our administration, um, and, and our students and incoming um, families and things like that coming, coming through. So I have a resource that I'll share with you later, um, but it is a, 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 a values assessment. And again, this is something that I've personally spent a lot of time, not, not the sheet necessarily, but the process um, I've spent a lot of time on identifying the core values of your organization um, and, your, and your own self. So uh, just as an example, I pulled up Illinois State University's um, website and they talk um, on their front page, it says, um, we, uh, we have a strong economy, fun culture and community giving big opportunities and unique experiences to kind of a small feel. Fabulous. Their student life um, big tag is um, get connected to campuses through involvement in student organizations and attending in-person virtual events. They talk about the importance of connecting um, 
through connecting to your community in the res halls in their surrounding community and in student activities on campus. Some core values that it lists right on their home page include educate, connect, um, tradition, um, diversity and accessibility, civic engagement, you know, and, and, and pulling people in um, from all from all walks of their student population, whether it's veterans, um, students with families, things like that. That is, those are clearly core values, right? So if your administration is wanting you to justify your planning and things like that, really identifying those core values so that you can come back to that to, to show how it's uh, supporting the strategy of your institution is only gonna help you um, maintain or increase your budget um, when when applicable. So really thinking about this from, um, you know, my intentionality for bringing all this up is really to, to look at, uh, for sure, the three of us here, but, um, you know, your agent partners as folks who can help you justify your role on campus and can really make sure that we are supporting you um, in maintaining the job security and making sure everything is easier ultimately for you. If it's difficult, we need to stop and say time out, where do we make this easier? Does that make sense? Um, so the final thing again, that will be on that um, worksheet that you can, can peek at is um, establishing a rubric when you can. So a rubric, just in basic definition, is a statement of purpose or function, okay? So I'll use my own self as an example. In my, my two core values are integrity and community, and that I determined those two core values after trying a whole bunch on for size for about nine months and ultimately landing on those. I feel out of whack when things aren't going um, in a way that aligns with integrity as I see it. And I also feel out of whack when um, the general good is not being served. And that's just Melissa Beer speaking. So I know that in order to make sure that I can stay aligned and stay on track, I have to make sure things are based on integrity and lifting everybody up as best as I, as I can and where possible. So if I'm given two choices, is this the right thing to do? And does it serve others along the way? That's that's my answer. So if I'm faced with a difficult situation, um, perhaps it's a show day snafu, perhaps it is a, a tough phone call, I know that I operate with, is this the right thing to do? And does it serve others in the way along the way? I say all this to establish a personal rubric and also to allow your students and your team members to also go through the process of considering a personal rubric so that you understand how people work. Folks working with me understand that I have to do things the right way, which let me be very clear, is not the fast way. <laughs> Sometimes there's lots of steps, but folks knowing me know that that's a value of mine and can honor that. And I know that uh, and the people that I work with, what their values are so that I can honor that. Instead of getting into the funky, like, oh, why is that person doing that? Well, it's part of their DNA. So um, I encourage you to do that for, again, for yourselves and for your teammates, but also for your organizations so that you can ask that question as the rubric or the statement of purpose of function. Does this build community? Does this educate and engage? Does this work with our strategic communication? Because then when you get into an assessment mode, you are armed with all of the data that people like that is sometimes difficult to find in live events that we'll talk about in, 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 in a bit. Um, with that brain dump <laughs> and regurgitation of all the things, um, I am happy to, again, think on it, ask questions, and, and we'll continue on um, and share that share the resources a little bit later too. Excellent. Okay. I am going to move that and apologize out loud. Uh, the room is maxed at a hundred. I don't know that we thought we we're going to have this many people in. And so tell your friends it's being recorded. We're sending it out. So I do apologize for that. Um, okay. So again, once you're through Melissa's incredible system and, and the resource that she has to share with you all for that is fantastic. Um, 
we still have some things to do before we get, begin planning. And so I'm a person that believes fully in uh, in making sure that you spend a little bit more time on the on the front end to save yourself a bunch of time and headache on the back end. And so um, if there is anything that you can do that is being done for every single show, um, make sure that you're you're making checklists. So is it a marketing uh, checklist? Is it a day of show event checklist? Is it a pre-show checklist? Making sure that you're really getting through all of those things. Um, in addition, are there email templates that you can set up? Are you sending the same information out to every single artist that comes to campus saying, hey, here's your parking pass. Here's where you should be parking. Here's what we should be doing. Uh, make that. Another good one that's really great, especially when Jolene comes into town uh, for your bigger acts, is making a list of restaurants in the area. I went to Luther College in Decorah, Iowa, which is tiny. And so nothing was open past like 9 p.m. So if you have a list of all of the restaurants that are uh, available in town, what it is that they serve and when their kitchen closes, that can be a game changer for people who live their life on the road and are really looking uh, to get some chow before they take off after their event. So those types of things are, are always really great. Again, at the end, we're sharing all of these different resources. So there are email templates for you. Uh, there, are, there is a marketing timeline that we'll talk about a little bit more in, in the in the coming slides. And then um, I didn't do anything with restaurants because that's all different, but that's one that I always think is, is kind of fun and different. Um, and this also leads into um, this next point that Jolene is going to go into, but leaving your position or helping the students that you work with or whatever it is better than you found it, or at least translated for that next person. So is there a binder that you can put together with, you know, here's my system for it that works, seems to work, whatever, um, and passing that along so that people can add to it. Maybe it's a Google Drive that you all use. I'm old school, right? So like, when I was doing concerts at Luther a million years ago, um, we had a binder, like a legit binder, and it just passed on from person to person. And so maybe it's a Google folder now that the new person gets added to, the old person gets taken out of, but at least has some general standard operating procedures for people to understand where they're coming from. Um, seeing everything that's come after COVID has been really interesting uh, to watch how uh, you know, obviously we've had the great resignation. We've had a lot of bumps in the road um, that have not allowed people to pass along this information as fluidly as would be, would be, you know, preferred. But if you have those types of things in place, that allows you to really help out the person that comes after you. Uh, and another just little nod to making your mark on that position that you hold. So I'll let Jolene go, go nuts with the rest of it here. <laughs> Well, um, I always like to kind of remind folks when we're starting to plan, you know, I work with campuses on kind of their, you know, biggest event of the year, so to speak, their spring fest or their, their big end of the year concert or their big welcome week concert, homecoming, whatever it may be. And I like to remind everybody that this, that's supposed to be fun, right? Like those, those are supposed to be the most fun events, uh, both to attend and to plan, and to keep that in mind when you're stressed out, because there's with, you know, when something costs your campus a lot of money, there's a lot of pressure. And we're finding that it makes folks, you know, especially students being given a very big responsibility, they get a little nervous. So I always tell them, take a deep breath. We've got you here. And I say everything is figure outable, which isn't a word, but uh, I use that word often because ultimately we can get through 99.99% of, of things, <laughs> you know, every once in a while, every few years, there's some way we can't get through a contract editing process and just can't come to meet terms. It almost never happens. We can usually figure out some kind of language that both parties can live with. So um, in general, to stress over it is, is taking years off your life when not necessary. We can get through it. Uh, the other thing to remember that I think students especially now feel is the pressure to provide an event that everyone wants to go to. And no matter what, you're never, ever going to please every person with every event. 
especially with, you know, your big event for the year, no matter who you book, you could book Beyonce and somebody's upset about it. So like you, <laughs> you know, because they wanted somebody else. So keep that in mind that you're never going to please every single person and that you're trying to create um, something that will please maybe the most people or, uh, you know, or bring something different to campus that hasn't been there before. You know, there could be different goals with each event. Creating a holistic calendar doesn't mean that every single event is for every single person, but ultimately your whole calendar, um, there's something in there for everyone. That's more so the goal. Um, I also like to remind folks that overall entertainers are human beings. They are, you know, you don't need to be intimidated by them, but also that, um, that they're, you know, they're a, they're a human and, and it's, it's hard when you're, when you're paying so much money to have somebody on your campus, you think, okay, well, they're going to spend the entire day with my students and we're going to just be best friends by the end of the day. But these are human beings that have kind of a, a rough travel schedule sometimes. And so they have parts of their life that they, um, you know, routines that they've put in place to make that life on the road possible. So just, you know, just know that everyone is a little bit different in what they need and in their own needs, wants, boundaries, I guess, to, to refer back to Melissa's, uh, you know, great uh, rubric here. The, the artists have that as well. So ultimately, every artist is different. So we say to ask the people you trust, ask, you know, the, the agents, you know, all of us are members of NACA. If you are a member, there's a lot of different great agents there that you can ask and trust and have a real conversation with about what artists are going to be good to work with. Who am I going to have a good experience with? What do I need to watch out for? And, and we're here to help. So, and as, you know, middle agents are folks that technically we are like a buyer's agent, which is a school's agent. So our job is to represent you as a university and as a school and talk you through it and help make sure that we're setting you up for success and to have a, a good experience or to guide you through what to do if things aren't ideal. So um, so yeah, so just remember to, to corner with people that you trust and that uh, you know this is supposed to be fun and we will get through it. Everything is figure outable. So now we'd like to just ask if anybody has any questions so far. I see some great conversations in the chat about various events that have worked really well on your campus. I see a lot of like homegrown things or, um, you know, take and makes different things in here that have worked really well. And that all of this is different from five years ago. And that's why all these questions are coming up, because today's student is not the same student of three years ago, five years ago, definitely not from 10 years ago. Things have changed. Does anybody have any questions right off the bat from what we've gone over so far? We're just making it so crystal clear. Everybody is writing down their clear roadmap of how <laughs> to start this process. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Melissa, do you want to, now we can get into kind of the um, oh, we have a question. What are the common trends that are not working in higher ed that we should avoid? Oh. Common trends that are not working in higher ed. Um, I wouldn't use the term maybe not working because every campus is a little bit different. So I hate to, you know, put everything in an all encompassing bucket, but I know that uh, there, there are some there's some things that we like we've added to contracts for instance and I know something that people are very conscious of is that artists that have said inappropriate things out loud are not appreciated like something that could be a um derogatory towards a group of person at any point like we we are very careful in watching for that stuff and if or if somebody has some charges against them we just know that risk management isn't going to appreciate that. So, so those are some non-starter boundaries that, that we've obviously been much more careful of when we're um, going through kind of the artist selection process with some of the bigger names. Melissa and Sue, what are some other trends that you're noticing that higher ed is avoiding? I think a, a trend that I'm seeing that affects, again, this space, folks representing and programming and things like that. Um, and, and very specific to the process of planning events, I want to say, um, 
you know, because as you all know, student activities in higher ed in general is all of the hats. So um, to just break that down into one very narrow lane here, I think that the um, the amount of responsibility on the plate of a higher ed professional to also plan events and to also care for their families and to also take a vacation or read a book is astronomical. Well, I don't think burnout and um, exhaustion is unique to this space. I think we see a lot of it. And with that comes a lot of turnover and um, then we lose knowledge. So I think for very, again, to be very niche, very, very um, specific to programming events on college campuses, um, I, I see a lot. It's not necessarily as quick of a process as it can be just because we're all figuring it out and what life looks like again as we exist on a Tuesday, right? Because it just changes so quickly. Um, so I think that's something that has, especially for, you know, folks, you know, like the three of us here have been doing it for 20 years. It's like, wow, things change uh, weekly, you know, and it used to be every couple of months. It used to be, you know, so I, I'd say that um, keeping up with the uh, the knowledge base is one um, and, and, you know, getting to know our generational students and, um, and things like that, just to make sure that we're serving all appropriately is, is a trend that I don't think it is problematic, right? Know better, do better. It's just more of an opportunity for everyone to, to, to be learning. Some days it just feels like we're drinking from a fire hose, if that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. And Liz, to answer your question a little bit about quick assessment options, um, I think, you know, if, if you have <clears throat> the capabilities uh, as people are leaving an event, it's so hard to send out a questionnaire, you know, something after the fact. But if you can grab that information while they're still in the moment, they're still thinking about it. And maybe it's a one or two question survey that they have to do on an iPad as they're leaving. That's a great place to grab that kind of information. If you're looking more for assessment um, on the front end of things. So uh, what should we be doing? What are you interested in seeing? Where do you see your, what are you and your friends talking about? Like those types of things. I don't know that there's like a one fit solution for that. I know that, you know, a lot of people tend to rely on some of like the texting apps and that kind of thing. If that's something that you have uh, for math, max, uh, mass texting, excuse me, on your campus. Um, but making sure that you're meeting the students where they are and in order to get the diversity that needs to be represented, that you're going to a lot of different spots on campus. So um, not just the dining hall, but maybe also going to um, a social justice meeting or uh, you know something in the campus chapel, so that you're hitting the students that are there for like a, you know any sort of worship something or another. So just to make sure that you are grabbing that cross section of your population. Um, and so question for you then, Liz, if you're doing the surveys already after the program, uh, are you getting good results on those? Are you, are you getting people to fill them out? Yeah. Hi, this is Liz. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, thanks for saying more about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we also, so it definitely, you know, like, uh, we do, you know, no more than like a five question survey, some paper, some QR code online as well for different modes and also usually with like a related incentive um you know this connected to the program um i think i just was trying to think of like is there anything else than surveys that people have found like helpful or fun if you do have a high traffic area and you're doing something where, you know, you are grabbing people as they're walking by, maybe it's something that you can, you know, I think about my kids are in elementary school and penny wars are a big thing, right? So maybe if it's like, you know, you've got the little buckets and you're like, what are you most ex interested in seeing on campus? Comedy, poetry, music, whatever. And then having some sort of token or ticket or something that people can just grab and throw in there. Um, you know, that's always a fun one. Uh-oh, Jolene. 
he had just put something like that in the. In the oh, chat. hilarious. <laughs> Agreed to you. Great, great um, yeah, but something that kind of shows that visually for people, but is also a thing that people are like, wait a second, what is, what is this thing doing here? Um, obviously that does take some volunteers and some other person hours and that kind of thing, but, um, could be another fun one. If you're, if you're just trying to like get to the nuts and bolts of what do you guys want to see? What, what is it that you, that you're looking to bring? And we're probably, we're going to talk a little bit about surveys later on too, when it comes to like choosing your, you know, choosing your artists and, and things like that. We can talk about that in a little bit because for me, it's easier to ask folks about past behavior rather than projected future behavior because they don't know until they see it or until they do it sometimes, um, or or they don't. You know, it's it's very hard to predict because not all artists are created equal. So, um, in everybody's minds, uh, so we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But from an assessment standpoint, I think you know. Uh, even going back to Melissa's rubric of wants, needs, boundaries, what was met from these? Did we accomplish what we set out to do? Did we do it within these boundaries? Did we did we fulfill the need? Even an internal assessment is a good is a good rubric to to go back to. Absolutely. And just for the folks who are watching later, you know, we're hearing visual polls via whiteboards. Um, the colored marbles in jars to indicate which choice or how much they liked something, uh, Google forms and social media polls to gain insight on what the students are wanting and what they thought about a program. Um, new question, if it's okay that we move on, uh, are we seeing recurring events be more successful in community building or more sporadic, bigger events helping in engagement and student relationships. And please, if you have insight on this stuff, please do share in the chat as well, or raise your hand or speak up. Um, there are a lot of great brains in this group. And so we wanna hear from everybody who has input on it, um, but I'll open it up to Melissa or Jolene if you've got anything too. Something we've experienced the past two years is the, the traditions. Uh, were lost a little bit during COVID. And, you know, if your spring fest is a concert, people, some, some students were not associating that, that name, that branding with a concert. So we said, even just naming spring fest concert or something to tell people what it is or a spring fest festival or a carnival or whatever it may be to tell people what your branded events are that's something we've noticed. Otherwise people are like, I don't know what it is. I don't know what to expect. And therefore I don't know how to dress. I don't know how to, how, you know, should I go with friends? Should I go alone? Can I go alone? There's a lot of uh, social nerves maybe from all of that. So we said not only, you know, name it something or tell people what it is, make it abundantly clear. But if you have video footage or if you can get video footage of the events, to kind of uh, create a, a visual of what to expect there. I think that that um, helps folks get over that. I don't know what to expect. I don't know what it is. I don't know how to dress. I don't know what to do to, you know, how how is this experience gonna be? That video footage is golden because it can kind of give folks a picture of, of the event and expectations. Yeah, exactly, Liz, less anxiety about it because they have a visual. So you know, enlist somebody in your group to take some video content, even if it's cell phone footage and you're posting it on your stories and your socials, just something to create that, um, that visual for next time when you're selling the same event to the next group of students. Anybody else? Oh, outfit of the day. That's cute. I love that. That's great, Sarah. Yeah, that's super smart. So we're hearing uh, marketing videos from past spring jams, uh, pre-COVID, which helped build interest and educate students who hadn't been able to attend the event. So uh, that that sounds like a really great uh, option there. Uh, reoccurring events go over well where uh, the dean is great with doing... Uh, one event a month. And so grilling with the deans, the dean Super Bowl party. Oh, that's cute. So you kind of have like a series of events with the dean. Um, 
And then uh, another comment saying the traditional events and programs tend to generate the most traffic and attendance. Uh, there's one group of students who are familiar and seek them out from year to year, and another group are curious and seek them out for uh, seek out those more accessible opportunities to socialize. So it sounds like it's, you know, I think any any question in this market can be answered with, yeah, all schools are different. And so, uh, which is frustrating, you know, we'd love to be able to give more uh, succinct answers, but um, it, it really does depend so much on, on your campus population. You know, are they, are they, more traditional? Are they commuter? Like all of those different things go into it as well. But I do think that um, Jolene's point of really making people understand uh, what to expect is is really good. And I have a few things to add that might actually go in um, well with our next kind of point of conversation. You I think to go on? Um, um, if, if you'd like to. Uh, I think what, um, uh, Sierra, your your question about, um, you know, and, and I'm just rereading that to, to, and then after listening to the conversation that followed, um, the goal of your question is um, community building. So um, to help engage and, and build student relationships. So um, what we heard was a lot of series programming um, what we heard, and I saw a lot of head nods and felt it deep in my heart when you said outfit of the day, that wow, wow, wee, wow, does that speak to my timid soul? I just tell me what and what to expect. And I'm, you know, that I'm much more inclined to go. Um, I, I think in understanding your community, right. And, and there's, a plethora of information that just you carry in your smart brains, but also that is available to us through our institutions and things like that with regards to how students interact, what we need. Also, just how you're seeing from your committee. Building community will always happen if someone is invited. Hey, I'd love to see you here. And obviously, we all know that not everybody reads the poster or clicks on the link or what have you. So something that I think is vital um, and it goes into the, again, to the top in the first part of the conversation. If, if we need to build community, we need to, um, we, it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. And I think that will um, grow so much more. But if, if each of us reaches five students, wow, you know, and then they reach out and that kind of builds that way. So I think having a series, even if it's just on Wednesday nights, we have events and knowing that each Wednesday it is going to be a different flair or to target a very specific student group that you have identified on campus that you want to cater to. Um, I think that's all very beneficial. Anytime you can take the think out of it, and have it be a safe, more comfortable place for people to walk into. Maybe that's why make and takes are partially so popular is because they don't need to worry about who they're going to sit next to or, or you know, where they, they put their garbage after it's all said and done. But just removing the think so people can just come and enjoy and take the weight off the world a little bit is, is probably a good idea. Um, so kind of creating the plan. Again, this is all in the name of efficiency in order to relieve brain space for you and your students so that you can get on to the other fires that start throughout your day. Um, but identifying who the event is for, and I'm going to kind of jump through this list a little bit, but who the event is for, and then identifying the groups on campus that would be able to support and maybe co-sponsor that. And keeping in mind that co-sponsoring is not just a financial partnership, it is um, a, a time partnership. So if, if maybe the health office doesn't have a programming budget, they might have some people power that they can help um, promote the event for you and, and cross promote that. Or perhaps you can, you know, you can say, can you come and, and be the hosts of the event and welcome people as they come in um, for this mental health speaker or whatever it is that you've you've got. Even if it is a make and take, I would really encourage you because we are all in the name of um, engaging and building community. Even when it is a make and take, I challenge you to find a group of students on campus or an organization of students on campus that you can collab with. Sometimes this is easier said than done because everyone is doing 
all the other duties as assigned. Um, but I think that that is a vital piece of collaboration and community building in the name again of hopefully making your job easier. So who is the event for and what other group can we get on campus to partner with us? So I think that's important. Um, what is the event, right? If it's for families, if it's for, um, if it's for a, an admissions event, if you're doing a student admission event, um, perhaps it's a tradition um, and, and you're gonna have a multi-generational audience, right? You'll have alumni, you'll have current students, maybe their, their families. Um, keeping all that in mind so that you understand the details. Who do we talk to about renting rooms? Who do we talk to about renting chairs and tables? And make sure that that information and that process for your campus is known by every member of your committee. Again, you might have to be the one that signs a contract or re even confirm or request the show to happen, but you can definitely empower your students to do a lot of that for you. And what a gift you give them in, in gaining that knowledge and a safe place to learn along the way. Um, so, so make sure that that is something that we know. It's also important to know where the event is going to happen. Um, even if it is, if it's an outside event and you want to have it in, in the weather just doesn't cooperate. <laughs> which is something we've all experienced, you must have a rain site, also known as an indoor place for the performance to go on um, to book the show. You, you have to make space for that. The artist or the event will not come on another day. That will cost you more money. Um, and ultimately, um, planning for that flexibility into your day will ultimately always make your life easier. Um, my parents always used to tell me, um, fail to plan or plan to fail. Um, so it's it's kind of that. So if, if you do not have a rain site, sometimes your contract won't be signed. It's something that people require um, in order to um, move forward with the event so that artists and their representatives know that you're taking the event and the details for the event seriously. I just encourage you to do that so that when, because live events, things happen, right? Like it's not about if things happen, it's what things are gonna happen. We all know that, or we'll learn that as event professionals. So if you can take that big thing, oh, what are we gonna do? Because now there's lightning five miles away, just take it off your shoulders and move it indoors. Um, but make sure that you know that when, when decisions are being planned for and made and it's not stressy. Um, understand your budget and what flexibility you might have. I cannot understate this or overstate this enough. Um, sometimes folks don't want to always share their budgets because they're worried that they're going to get had. And I understand that. I totally understand that. And to Jolene's point previously, it's really important for you to work with people that you trust. Um, my favorite conversation is when someone says, you know, for example, you know, I have $3,500, but I'd really only like to spend $2,500 because I want to keep that extra money for an another event that we're planning or we're going to have food. We want to beef up the marketing. I really, really, really appreciate that transparency and conversation because ultimately I represent my artists, but at some point of the game, I represent you to them. So I think that that's really important to understand your budget and how it works, what wiggle room you have, what wiggle room you don't, and just get it on the table if it's someone that you trust as quick as you can, again, just so that you can move forward quickly um, to kind of yes and no your, your way through your, your shopping process, okay? And the other thing to keep in mind beyond venues, tables, chairs, your basic setup needs are um, production. Do you, you can always review riders for free prior to um, confirming anything. Make sure that if you don't have the riders, you have a conversation with the agent to make sure that, you know, that everything is necessary. If there's any flexibility within the rider, or that you do hire um, outside production uh, in order to accommodate your event. And, and again, that that all can happen in, in the way that you're hoping, if it's outdoors, if it's inside, is your rain site a, a place with a floor that needs protected? Do you have the accommodations to protect that floor so the university maintains um, their vision of you in a positive light? <laughs> um, that is just really quick 
in a nutshell, um, but ultimately it comes down to understanding on campus process. I think, you know, kind of thrown into this as well as understanding your print shop and what they need, understanding um, kind of just the process and, and even budget codes to, to, to get those things kind of push through the pipeline so that it's something that you know as much as possible going into it and it isn't something that creates a fire alarm along the way. Okay, I'm gonna chat a little bit about choosing your talent and this looks different depending on what you're doing or, or choosing an event. So because I deal with um, folks on, again, kind of their bigger event of the year, I often get an email saying, hey, this is our concert day. This is our welcome week concert day. We have a budget of um, you know, $50,000 total and we have a, that gives us about 30,000 to spend on the artist give me a list of artists in um, pop, hip hop, or uh, country genres. Okay, so I'll put together a whole list from all across different agencies for them. That's one example of, of a way we put together kind of an, an artist list. And then the committee will kind of stew over that list, go through, you know, debate back and forth about those different names. And other times people will email me and say, I absolutely want Waka Flocka. Flame. I don't care what it costs. This is my artist. This is, I have lots of dates. Tell me what dates he's available and, and we can go check dates. Um, there's, there's other times as well, where people have already kind of done some research and said, Hey, these are 10 artist names that our committee came up with that they're interested in. What do they cost? How are they to work with? And I'll go through that list and give pricing and information. So that's kind of what a middle agent does for the selection process when it comes to those bigger names. But in general, if you are like, you know, like, like Melissa mentioned, I, you know, I have 3,500, but I want to spend 2,500 and you have a few trusted agents that you know and trust their rosters are going to be sound email those agents and they can even recommend others too as if they, if you just can't find something on their rosters that you like you know email people you trust the when you're choosing the bigger name artists do a simple google search <laughs> it will save you some grief later and tell and and suggest that each of your students if they're coming to the table with ideas okay to be able to justify to your peers and to uh staff folks, okay, why do you want that artist? Why do you think they would be a good choice? Check their social media, you know, ask questions about how they are to work with. Google their name plus university to see if, have they ever played a different university before? You know, there are some simple searches you can do online to just make sure that you're working with someone that hopefully will, has played a university before and might understand some of the nuances of that. And a, a middle agent will help you through that process. Uh, you can feel free to reach out to other campuses if you see that they've played a campus that, oh, hey, I know somebody at that university. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call over there and see how they were to work with. That's, again, where a middle agent comes in handy is there's a good chance they've worked with most artists in the past or, you know, the industry is, is big and small at the same time. And all of us, you know, text each other when somebody is really terrible to work with because we all don't want the other campuses or other people's clients to have a bad <laughs> Uh, a, a bad experience. Yes, Melissa mentioned you can also ask an agent for a list of references. Sure. We have schools even do that for the bigger name artists too. So we'll reach out to a few different universities and get little blurbs from those uh, stating how the, that artist was to work with. Easy. Uh, and, and if somebody asks you for that, please provide that information and honest outlook of how it was to, to work with that artist because that's going to save everybody grief or help them get over the, the hump of, um, you know, being able to book that artist. So uh, we, budgets are tight <laughs> and budgets are uh, being reduced for a lot of folks. I don't know if, if anybody on this call is experiencing a budget cut and kind of worried about how you're going to do your traditional programs. I think, uh, you know, just being transparent, some folks say, well, I can't afford to use a middle agent because there is a fee associated with that. The time and money that middle, a middle agent can save you is, is huge and it will pay for itself. Um, as an example, I had a school that really, really wanted a certain artist and they went to their production company and got a $90,000 production quote from, from their production company. 
And I said, can I just introduce you to a different company or can we just solicit a couple bids here? I got their production down to 35,000 from 90. So I greatly made up for my fee just in a couple phone calls. And, and then they met a new production company that they now love and work with regularly. So, you know, little things like that, where it's no more work on your part and somebody's taking that off your plate are invaluable. And you can save a lot of money by somebody else kind of taking care of some of the issues or another time an artist, you know, was quoting $60,000. And I'm like, yeah, they're quoting that, but we've gotten them for 50,000. Let's go in with a $50,000 um, offer. It's close enough, but it's not insulting. I think they'll still take it. And they took the offer. So right there, just in those couple of conversations of, Hey, this is my experience. I think we can save you 10 grand. Boom. They, they made up for more than, than our fee. So so keep all of those things in mind that they that they will save you money. And Melissa mentioned earlier, or Sue did, always ask for a rider. You can always ask for a, a rider from the big artist, any any size artist. And some of them don't have it. They're like, hey, I just need a microphone and a sandwich and I'm great. Uh, great. Uh, if they don't have an official rider, that, that's okay too. But always ask for those needs before making an offer. So you can include in your offer, hey, we can do all your production except for the video wall. The video wall is going to cost us an extra 10 grand. And it's not in the budget, you know, put it in there, no video wall. And then they know from, from the offer not to expect it. Um, I, before we go to like some of the homegrown events talking, you know, we touched on surveys earlier, but when talking about surveys for choosing the, the major artists, it's really tempting to put out a list of a whole bunch of names or ask for suggestions from the crowd. But sometimes that can be challenging because like we said, not everybody agrees on things and you're going to get a lot of suggestions that your campus cannot afford. Um, Open-ended questions always terrify me. <laughs> Who knows what you're going to get back? Um, but in general, I find that an effective way to ask, you know, one survey question that's effective to ask if you're looking for genres is what was the genre of the last concert you paid money for a ticket for? Because that's asking about past behavior instead of trying to let folks guess what they'll do in the future. And it can kind of help, um, it can help narrow down your, your uh, genres if you're surveying for gen genres. Um, and then if you do want to put out a list, if that's your tradition of putting out a list of five to 10 different artists and having the students check or, you know, um, you're polling them on who they would go to see, just make sure you've pre-qualified that list, you know, making sure those artists are available for your date and within your budget before you ask. Otherwise, you're going to kind of overpromise and underdeliver. Uh, and also make sure they can't see the results, <laughs> because if you if that artist between the time of putting your poll out and getting the results, you know, booked up a different show, well, they're no longer available. And, and again, you just overpromised because they saw who won the survey and you, you can't get them anymore. So, so keep those things in mind when you're surveying. So when it comes to other, you know, not the national level artists, some of those more homegrown events, uh, how, how do you all find your homegrown events that are, you know, either student talent or local talent? Um, does anybody want to add some, some feedback in the chat for how they do that on their campus? And Melissa and Sue, feel free to give examples of when people reach out to you, you know, what are they asking you for? Sure. I would say, you know, a lot of people say, oh, we're looking for a variety act or a magician or a hypnotist or whatever. Um, this is our date. That's always really helpful. Uh, and then knowing budget again is really helpful as well. But I think it's always, you know, especially if you're new and exploring different options, it's always so good to be able to come in and take a look at a few different things because most agencies are going to have a couple different options for you. And so whether or not that's a date specific thing, you know, this person works for this date, but not that date, you know, those different things. Um, there are definitely some options there. Uh, but I, I always love sending those emails because then it's exciting to me to see who they come back with. Because uh, again, it it varies every time. And, and so that always, you know, that's always different. But um, 
I, I think that just general ask, sometimes people too will come in and say, this is the type of event we want to have. What have you seen work on other campuses? And that's the, another beauty of working with those agents and uh, people that you trust. They talk to folks all over the country. So they're talking to schools just like yours, but in different parts of the country. So they can say, hey, this actually, I, if you're talking casino night, I just had this person do this and it was bonkers. It was so fun, you know, like that kind of stuff. So that then we can, we're able to kind of fit that stuff in there for people. I think that also, especially if you all have a, a solid grasp on what you need and want, or par partly what you, pardon me, what you need and what you must accommodate, what you must work around, the opportunity to call someone that you trust, or even a school, a, a colleague that you trust, appear on another campus and say, you know, here's what it has, here are the boxes it has to check. Um, what ideas do you have for me or have have you had any anything similar work really well for you that I might not be thinking of right I think um you know I have the the hours in my day where I'm able to be creative aren't always business hours so being um able to lean on the valued opinions and things like that of, of other folks in my shoes is is a a way that I navigate that quite a lot um Amy, can, I would love to address your question about charging students for events. Um, I was involved in, again, as an agent, um, I was involved in a conversation where, um, you know, by and large, I'd say um, general, you know, normal weekly events aren't charged for. Folks don't charge for them. The larger shows people charge for the their tickets. Um, but I was involved with a conversation where um, one particular university, and I would have to dig real far to, to see who it was, would charge like a dollar or some type of commitment to get in because there was, it, it honestly might have even been COVID times, um, but they needed some type of a buy-in because when people would see it's free, they wouldn't come. But if they would saw that it was, oh, bring a can good for the food drive or a pair of mittens for the mitten drive or something like that. People were more vested um, and it wasn't just about them any longer, if that makes sense. So I don't know if that helps you, but I that just your question reminded me of a um, a conversation that I was a part of with someone that was it, it, it still wasn't a lot. Right. And if 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 money is ever a barrier, obviously, maybe there's scholarships available, something that you can say to let folks know that it's accessible to all, um, but just more having kind of a vested buy-in. We've oh. some, somebody also suggested like charging for faculty, staff, guests. We often have that because at the end of the day, student fees are paying for the, you know, the, the show or the event to happen. So as, as long as your um, student tickets are lower than outside guests or faculty staff, whomever it may be public, people are seeing what kind of discount they get as a student. I think that's really valuable, even if it's even if it's students get in free, however, we're charging for anybody else. And that's how we get around some of the, I hate to say like this is getting into the weeds, but like a radius clause for a major artist, that's also how you can get around some of that. Like if students have a boyfriend, girlfriend, friend in town, whatever, and that's a barrier to coming because they can't leave or their sister brother is in town, but if they could pay for a guest ticket for that person to join them to come to the event, it gets more people in the door. It gets more people in your videos and your social media and everything else. And it, and even if you have to charge them, it, it's a, it's taking away one of those barriers that might prohibit somebody from coming. So it's, it's nice if people can bring a guest. I know that there's uh, risk assessment things and, and risk management might have, you know, uh, disagree. So you want to check with them on that, but For sure. Well, and Kathy here says we charge for everyone except the students for larger events and use it as a fundraiser for our emergency student loan fund. That's really cool. It's another nice. really great way to give back um, and have people tied to what they're doing. That's cool. Um, excellent. Okay. So next up is the offer. And so, you know, as we've talked about, the offers can look a lot of different, a lot of different ways. So, you know, where Jolene has a very 
seriously serious document with all of the things laid out. Um, oftentimes I'll get, hey, can we grab that person for this date? You said it was this much and that's it. It's just two pages. Well, it's more serious than what I get. Um, but if you are uh, doing that offer, obviously, if you're working with the middle agent, they're going to walk you through all of that stuff. So it's nothing you've got to worry about or anything. Um, but when when um, offering to bring someone with uh, a smaller agency, uh, more like Rebel or Bash Schuler, you know, you want all of the information on there. So you're going to want to know the, the who, what's, when's, where's and why's. Um, you're going to want to let them know about the time of show and what time they would want to be there for setup and sound check. That's really important, especially at certain times of year as people are crisscrossing the country and it's not necessarily a great routed uh, event, but it's it's people need their date at their date and, and that's the only thing we can do. Um, offering the amount of money that was either requested by the uh, artist or, or quoted to you or whatever you go with uh, on advisement from, from your counsel there, that's important. Uh, include everything. So I think it's really important to talk about audience and who's going to be in the audience and are there any content restrictions and, um, you know, making sure that uh, if you're a net 30 campus and people are expecting not to be paid until 30 days after the fact, definitely let them know that because boy, they don't like that uh, if they don't know about it. Uh, if you've got funky insurance stuff, so maybe it's not a $1 million policy, it's a $2 million policy or something like that, you know, making sure that you've got that, um, any sort of information on, are you doing a ticket, what the ticket prices are going to be, um, any sort of marketing plan you have for that, uh, like for Jolene's stuff, obviously the radius clause, and for anybody who's not familiar, radius clause just means um, because you are being paid to play this show, you know, we aren't able to book within this distance for this amount of time. So, you know, Melissa lives like 30 miles from me here in the Twin Cities. So if she books somebody at her house, you know, and they have a you know, they've got a 60 mile, 30 day radius clause. I'm not going to be able to book them at my house within that month so that they're able to, you know understand what they can and can't do moving forward. Do you have a merch rate? You know, are you, are you taking a percentage of that merch that's being sold on site? Um, are you maybe, maybe it's not a merch rate. Maybe you're just saying, Hey, can you flip the people who sold merch for you? Like a t-shirt or whatever, that would be really cool. Um, and then who's going to be providing what is the, um, artist in, you know, responsible for their sound, for their lighting, for anything else. Um, and then uh, as far as, um, you know, is, is the band bringing their own stuff? Will you need to go procure a drum kit and uh, xylophone for, for everyone? I don't know, but um, making sure that that's all squared away. And then again, referring back to my, my most important thing, food, uh, is that getting, is that taken care of? Who is supplying it? How many meals? All of those things. And like how many hotel rooms? You know, sometimes you've got people who double up. Sometimes you've got people who uh, need separate rooms, that kind of thing. Um, and then finally, if it is that, that larger event, um, especially, uh, but for our types of acts too, if you're looking for someone to do a, um, like a teaser at lunchtime, and then a performance at you know 7 or 8 p.m. That's a big window of time. So that might not be possible with travel. So making sure that your expectations are laid out on the front end so they can say anything from, no, we can't do that, to we'll do it if we're able to get in that early, to, you know what, if somebody could take us around at dinner, instead of at lunch, that would be preferred because we're able to get in at 3 p.m. And, and that's what we can do. So um, if you're interested in them making a cute little video so that you can use that on your socials to send out to the students, that's always fun. Um, some people are going to do that automatically. Some people are going to want um, to know that they need that they're expected to do that later.
So when Amy made a good point here in the chat, she said we tried to host a concert and quickly realized we were not set up with the right equipment for a concert. Something to remember with offers is, is the reason we went through so many other things before we got to this, this slide is because you want to make sure when you submit an offer that you mean it because people are going to start booking their travel. They're going to like, they're going to assume this offer is sound. And if they confirm it all is a green light and they're going to start booking travel, making plans, took taking that date off their calendar, all the things. So, so that's why it's so important to be ready. And that's why my offer worksheet, Sue is two pages. It's so that everybody can kind of go through those things and go, Oh, we don't, we don't have that. We don't, oh, we don't have a rain site. Oh, we don't have this. You know, there it, it's so that if, if it's really not possible that you find out before you get too deep into it and, and there ends up being major disagreements because people are out money. So that's where it, you want to make sure you mean it. And then in terms of like what you want to, you know, why it would be great to include as much as you can on an offer, even, you know, if it's to Sue, Melissa, whomever, and it's in an email, great. We have a worksheet that we use um, for folks to fill out, and then we basically transfer that into an official offer to send to a, a national level artist. But ultimately, if that if the information isn't on the offer, it might not get transferred onto the contract, and the contract is what protects you if something, you know, were to happen or if somebody doesn't fulfill a need they don't know that they didn't fulfill a need if it's not on the contract because sometimes the offer never makes it further than this person's desk and you know doesn't get to the artist so that's why it's a um it's a it's a really important there's a couple other comments in here yeah sarah had said you know we don't do firm offer forms at weaver um but you know is this going to prevent me from being able to book performers and speakers. And on our level, no, but I think Melissa also brings up a really great point there where, it, you know, you're probably going to get asked all of those questions so that they can kind of have it all in one spot, just like Jolene is saying, to be able to transfer it over to the contract. But it also um, provides the uh, paper trail as well that's going to protect both you and uh, the agent so that you've got that referral point um, in case there's a question about it later on. Sarah, I don't know if this is helpful, but we do have a university that can't call it an offer. They have to call it a proposal. And then we include in bold highlight a statement about how, while we have every intention of moving forward with this, our, our contracting office does not consider this fully, you know, confirmed until the contract is fully executed or something. Some statement to, to help those folks that won't let you use an offer, you know, to, to appease them. But at the end of the day, reputation also matters. So if that if that language is what you need to include for the sake of um, those that make the rules, as long as you're seeing your events through and you have that reputation of they're going to see it through, it's going to go through with a contract, it's going to move forward, you know, all the things, then you're in a good spot and you can do things like that and call it a proposal or, or do what you need to do to, to please others. But yeah, it's a, it, it, some people just aren't able to call it an offer or whatever the nuances are that bother somebody in, in a risk assessment office, <laughs> as long as you're seeing those things through, you're going to be in a good spot, even if you have to kind of reword things, um, and, and work some magic. I, I include blanket statements like that on a, on a few, um, universities offers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then Tia's talking, finding blow through barricade can be darn near impossible. Julie. Production companies, you get, you might have to ask a couple different production companies and staging companies, but somebody's got it. It's just, you're in a difficult location. You might have yeah. to go to Vegas. Yeah. You've got lots. <laughs> All right. Oh, there you go. Jolene. Okay. So, um, the difference between an offer, you know, the difference between an inquiry, an offer, and a contract is important. An inquiry is just, you know, searching and asking questions and asking, is this artist available? Um, that's why an offer worksheet from us or like something that really spells out, we'd like to bring this off, you know, spells out clearly to Melissa or Sue, we'd like to bring this artist to campus. Here are the details. That's an offer. Or our two-page worksheet is an offer. 
And then once something is confirmed, you move to contract. Now, when you, when you submit an offer, you can get one of three responses. You can get a, a confirm, which is great. Okay, move on to the contract. Okay, send it over to me. You can get a pass because that date isn't available or whatever it may be. You can get you know a, a, a no is sometimes a second best answer because at least it's clear. And then you can get a counter offer, which means somebody comes back to you and say, hey, I can do this as long as you can provide two hotel rooms or $250. Or I can I can do this if you um, can add five thousand dollars to it. Otherwise, we can't make it work financially. You know, you'll get a counter offer. And keep in mind, you can say no to a counter offer, and they still might be able to make it work. Or you can say, well, I can't do five thousand more. I can do twenty five hundred dollars more. That's my maximum. Can we still get this done? And they say, okay, yep, we can make that work. So keep in mind, counter offers are still kind of an active conversation and you want to make sure you're clear with them on a yes, no, can I meet those counter offer things? Even if you say no, they still might make it work. Okay, once you confirm a show, you move on to contract and your, your, uh, your purchasing office isn't going to like that I tell you some of these things. <laughs> but uh, why why I put at the top here why it matters and why it doesn't is that sometimes in your positions, the contracts are somewhat out of your control because it's a higher up person that edits it. It's a different office. They go through it. Uh, ultimately, what you can control is, is the nuts and bolts of what you need communicated in that contract. So even if you move it along to the next office, make sure the things that you needed in there from that offer, like we talked about, are reflected in the contract because sometimes they're just missed. Sometimes it's not in a agency's template or whatever. And your PG-13 content restriction didn't make it onto the contract. You know, whatever it may be, you want to make sure all of the things from your offer are on that contract. So do that before you pass it to anybody else. Um, if you have a middle agent, they will also look it over. For edits, um, either that, somebody in some other office makes those edits. Your middle agent can also make suggested edits on how to kind of protect yourself a little more. And sometimes it's up to you to go through that and kind of um, le read all the legal jargon and your brain melts because it's a lot sometimes on reading the legal jargon of some of the major agency contracts. So again, go to people you trust that have either done it before on your campus or your middle agent, or if you have a question from, you know, Melissa or Sue's contract, obviously ask, ask the agent, ask them, but they can kind of help you through it. Um, at the end of the day, that contract is your leverage if something doesn't go right. So for instance, if you require a 60 minute set, make sure it says 60 minute minimum set somewhere on your contract, because that's your leverage if somebody leaves stage after 40 minutes. And you can say, hey, you didn't fulfill your contract. It's right here. Um, the, the content clause, like I said, um, insurance requirements. So that, again, nothing's missed along the way. So the day before the show, when you realize I never got a certificate of insurance from them, you can go you can go back to them and say, hey, this is required contractually. Ah, we, never, we haven't gotten it from you yet. Can you send it over? They can't argue because it's in there. Um, and anything else that, you know, your, your non-negotiables. So if it's important to you, your campus, make sure it's in your contract. A contract, this is why I say why it matters and why it doesn't. I would love to tell you that if you have a contract, an artist will never cancel on you and nothing bad will ever happen. <laughs> I would love to be able to tell you that, but artists are human and they get sick and, you know, flights get canceled, things happen. So while a contract can protect you and, and help ensure that you get what you're looking for, it, it can't guarantee that nothing, um, that nothing goes wrong or that some unexplainable problem, you know, arises. So, so keep that in mind that it, it protects you only so much for the things, but at the end of the day, these are still all humans and we're dealing with, I mean, airline travel is as glamorous as ever right now and things, things happen. So, um, so the contract matters to protect you, but at the end of the day, it can't stop all the things. The, oh, and people are making comments about different contracting processes, depending on the level of financial commitment. Yes. If you know that at $10,000, it gets move to a different office, it's okay to offer an artist $9,999 and explain why. 
because if you say it is a tenfold easier process at one less dollar, they say, sign me up, you can keep that dollar. <laughs> so keep, keep that in mind. People are usually pretty uh, reasonable when it comes to that. Absolutely. All right. We're close to another break for questions here. So uh, marketing then, uh, this is another resource, this little timeline here on the right-hand side, that's another resource that'll be listed in the Google Drive at the end that you'll all have access to. But essentially, you know, it kind of runs the timeline down from, you know, one to three months out from your event. Um, some people are booking that far out. Some people are not, but if you are able to, this is kind of just a general guideline, use it as, as you like. Um, but really, you know, as far as marketing, I think that there's a couple big points to make. So meet your students where they are. So, um, you know, don't put up a bunch of posters in the back of the library if that's where no one is, but, if you are going to use the resource and print posters, does it make sense to hang them in bathrooms why, where they're washing their hands or, you know, something like that? Um, does it make sense to put it on, uh, you know, little stand-up cards on tables in an eatery on campus, whether that be a cafeteria or somewhere else? Uh, is it a mass text option? Is it chalking sidewalks? Is it um, you know, other other interesting ways of of using that. I've seen a lot of schools who use one event to promote the next event. And so the students know that like maybe if they stick around through the whole event, they're going to come back and they're going to get like, um, you know, a, a sticker for attending that event, like a, like a cool, not like a tour chart sticker, but like a, like a cool water bottle sticker, vinyl sticker. Um, and then they're also going to learn, they're going to be the first ones to know who the big show is that year, you know, like something like that. Maybe someone's using a make and take event. And instead of printing a logo or something on the t-shirts, your little buddy that you get has the calendar on it. It would be tiny print. You'd have to wear your glasses. But um, you get my point where you use some of those bigger events that are really hitting a lot of folks and then able to um, able to, to really market the other stuff that's coming up. Uh, use all your platforms. Do you have a radio station on campus? Do you have closed circuit TV? Uh, do you have podcasts that people do? Like, are there different ways that you can engage those different folks that that tune in in different ways on campus um, so that you are reaching the, the biggest group. Are you doing something? Um, do you have like a, a leaders meeting on campus? So you get all of the, you know, whether it be a cabinet full of campus leaders across all of the different organizations on campus, are they getting together? And is that important to kind of do a rundown of, hey, this is what our event schedule looks like. Please make sure that you're telling your members and getting the word out because we want to see people there and we're really excited about who we're bringing in. Uh, and then tracking what's working best. You know, I think one of the things that COVID taught us is that um, sometimes touching people and, and making a connection with a person is is more important than um than the biggest numbers ever and so to jolene's point way back at the beginning of of the of the session you know talking about a holistic calendar that everything is not going to be for everyone however you know you can really pinpoint different groups on campus different populations and have them feel seen, you know, representation is so important for people um, to feel like that event really connected with me and I'm really excited, but how are you tracking? And to go back to Melissa's rubric, how are you tracking what works best? How are you tracking what success is? Is it just a number or is it the engagement that you have? Is it, you know, how people are interacting with each other? Um, how people are talking up the events after the fact, those types of things are really important too. And then how are you building community through your marketing? So are you, um, you know, putting together any sort of like giveaways? Are you, uh, are you incentivizing, um, you know, promoting the event while it's happening by taking photos and tagging all sorts of different folks while they're there to increase the crowd on site? You know, are, the, are you talking about what's coming up and, you know, um, 
being vague about things, but like sneaky and and getting excited about it. Are you, are you doing fun things? Like, um, I don't know. We were talking in my family the other day about how, um, people who drive Jeeps have the little rubber ducks and then they put little ducks on other people's Jeeps. And that's just a thing that everybody does. And my, my kids were like, well, I don't get it. And it was like, well, it's, it's not really for you, but it's that community because they're, they're very in, invested in, in that piece of it. And they love doing that. So are there ways that you can really make someone's day on like, oh my gosh, I just found this duck. How cool, you know, like whatever it might be, maybe it's little rubber, whatever your mascot is. But if there are ways that you can really build community amongst those events so that people are excited about the next one they're um they're engaged enough to maybe come out to a meeting they're telling other people about it once you get those types of fans for your stuff if people are that that is the best that is the best marketing that you can have is word of mouth and so if somebody says man we we went to this event last weekend and the comedian was so funny i cannot wait to go to another one of those that is, you know, far and away the best you can do. So I think as you move through that that little timeline and as you're thinking about all of your different efforts, making sure that you're thinking about how you are building up, um, you know, the things that people think about once they leave school, hopefully some of those events and some of those programs and some of those moments are going to continue to make them emote years and years and years later. You know, I think about my college career and I, I have a I have a like vivid memory of being in the catwalk above the stage during one of my larger shows because I was the person that brought in the main, um, you know, big named acts or whatever. And he hit his guitar and put his head up like this. And like, we locked eyes from that distance, but like, that was such a cool moment. I will never, ever, ever in my whole life forget how that felt and how I felt putting that whole event on. And so I hope that that's something that that community brings to you all and you can pass on to the other folks in your in your campus community. Questions? Can I talk to, there's two things in the chat I want to talk to. Oh, um, yeah. One, just on the marketing and event when there's seven other events going on. Ooh, I, I think folks here appreciate that. Just, yeah, snaps for that one. It's a, a common a common difficulty. Um, some advice that I use for the shows we book is ultimately people want to see people they know, right? And sometimes our budget doesn't let us have someone we know at every single event. So if you can somehow um, put together, uh, uh, just put your feelers out for, you know, maybe you have a student who is interested in comedy, give them three minutes in front of the comedian to do time and have them help promote your show. People will come to see someone they know, right? So it's their friends, heck yeah, let's go friend. Um, anytime you can build up an event around the actual event, right? So, you know, it doesn't necessarily always have to be, uh, you know, so-and-so's idol or so-and-so has talent or, or whatever the case may be. It can simply be, um, you know, maybe it's your school mascot, right? Who somebody you have, you get your school mascot or someone like that to, to dress up and introduce the show or make some announcements. I think any time, again, that you can branch out beyond the committee and find um, your other organizations and folks on campus to help promote the show, even if it is a student performer or, you know, come to the show and enter to win, you know, whatever the case may be, um, it, it, it can help and it can't cut through the noise, but sometimes I'm a person who just believes in true transparency and authenticity. So maybe it's even just your marketing is, I know there's 1100 other things going on. Ours is the best, you know, maybe it's just that would cut through the noise even sometimes. So I mean, maybe that's something to try, but I do always recommend having you include people they know um, at some point of the show. And then if I could back up to Amy, I think it was Amy's uh, question about timelines, um, fiscal year timelines. Was that you, Amy? I think it was. Um, 
there are so many possibilities there and a real one I always feel like is this week because July 1 is a turning point for so many folks too and some people can can confirm around that and some people just have to wait and that's okay but I have a lot of delayed send contracts to be sent out on on Saturday like just because it's everybody needs them July 1 but they also want to confirm them so my artists have already and they're people that I know and trust and are good for it also like I it is a you know that relationship piece too um and it's because folks have told their process to say we can confirm this date but because of my my you know, the autonomy that I have, I cannot officially reserve the funds with my university until July 1 or September 1 as the case may be, no problem. We protect the date from on the artist calendar, and then we push through what they need with a date of July 1 so that it everything checks out on their system. So I, I think that any time you can just say, this is what I'm working with, there's literally nothing that you can do to change that process on your end. So you have to just be upfront with it and people can take it or leave it. Right. And ultimately once, um, you know, again, those relationships build up, if there's so many things that we can do to work around that, um, in order to get you what you need and honor your process, but also protect our artists and make sure that they're aware of what's going on too. And it's, it's purely a communication thing. So generally the bureaucracy that we as agents deal with is significantly less um, than what you deal with. So our preferred plan of action is whatever makes your life easier. And I know that that is a broad statement and I should really only speak for my business, but I also know these, these women and <laughs> know that we probably are on the same page here. So our, literally our choice is whatever makes you feel like you're being taken care of and can breathe easy. <laughs> I had a school that their fiscal year turned over September 1st and their first concert of the year was like September 1st. <laughs> so they couldn't get a check processed in time. So again, that was one of those things that we made abundantly clear on the offer that said, you'll get, it takes two weeks. Payment will be sent September 16th or whatever the date was, because it was a very clear cut process that they could not check. They could not process a check for the next fiscal year until the next fiscal year hit. So no matter what, like, everything is figure outable. We can work through it as long as we know, you know, as long as we're clear on the front end or we can figure out a, a path forward and make everybody aware. There's some really good questions. Does anybody have, there was a lot covered in that, in the last couple of slides between choosing an artist, offer contract marketing. Feel free to add questions here because there's just so many different parts and pieces to those. And again, every campus has a different process. Every campus has, has a different student body. Um, everything's a little different everywhere. I did mention it in the chat, but do make sure that you understand what kind of, if you have an entertainer's tax, um, that's always, that's something we can work around, but it's, it, it's pretty important that we know that before a contract is sent back and adjusted as this is what the check will be. Um, it's significantly easier to negotiate things before the contract is sent out than after. For sure. Does anybody have any contract or offer? questions there's just so every campus is so different and these processes keep changing so if your process changes or something changes throughout the event you know just make everybody aware communication is key just keep those the lines of communication open there's a lot of folks talking about just how many different events people have pulling them in different directions And I think that your solutions are really cool, you know, to collaborate on things, to bring together, uh, you know, kind of an oversight committee to be able to uh, see, you know, what's going on and and what can happen and what can't, all of those different things. But um, but yeah, I think I think that um, it, it it is hard because you are you know, you, you are competing, I, I guess, but, um, 
you also might not be, you know, if you flip the, the lens a little bit, um, you might not be competing for the same students that would come to your programs as would go to the other things that are also being offered at that same time frame. Um, and I think that when that does, when that overlap starts to uh, to happen more, that's when you kind of have to go and have the conversation with those folks that seem to be, have the same date choices as you all the time and and make sure that uh, that you're just chatting about it to see how you can work together better. Yeah. I know a lot of folks are charged with doing events like Halloween weekend, <laughs> like they're asked to, pr to provide programming on campus, but we all know Halloween weekend, everybody goes out or a lot of, a lot of students go out, but that doesn't mean everybody does. Okay. So how can you work with that problem? Not against it. How can you, um, provide, you know, something where there's free food maybe, or maybe your event is a little earlier. So people still can go out, but those that don't want to go out still have something to do. Maybe it's an event with an after party. Maybe it's, um, you know, what can you add to the event that makes it anything that takes away the barriers, right? Mm -hmm. I like a lot of people are mentioning collaborating with others. Somebody else mentioned like yeah. for Halloween, they do something the Thursday before rather than like the Saturday of Halloween weekend. Yep. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And at the end of the day, some of you are in markets where there's just a lot going on. <laughs> like if you're a campus that's based in Vegas or you're based in New York City or something, there's always stuff going on. So how can you make it more student specific that they wouldn't find anywhere else, I guess, is, a, is the key there. Sue, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say in the interest of time, I think we got to keep rolling. Cool. So advance. Um, so for this one, you know, uh, this is going to look a little bit differently for the artists that Melissa and I represent versus the advance that Jolene would be doing Um I, I know that for our roster, um, we have them do it so that everything is communicated directly and uh, and hopefully nothing is missed. But this is, again, that really great time for you to be able to have a checklist of all of the things you want to cover in that in that conversation um, and and making sure that as we've made it to just about time for the event, you know, everybody has clear expectations on what's going on. And so I think um, you want to talk about about, you know, who, again, where do you need to park? Where should we meet you on campus? This is the address I have. Is this not correct? Um, ask all the questions that you have of that person at that time, because once they get on site, um, there might be busyness or a feeling of hurried. And then, you know, those, those questions kind of tend to leave your brain a little bit, but making sure that you understand their travel plans, if they have other things that they need to be doing, you know, for whatever reason on site while they're there. Um, and then, you know, Hey, we bring a, I, I don't necessarily need a, you know, green room or anything, but could you lock my backpack up because it's got my laptop in it and I just want to make sure that it's safe while I'm on stage, you know, those types of things. So um, I think it's always really important to make sure that um, you talk about the correct phone numbers so that everybody's got the right cell phone numbers, those cell phones are on and that person is ready to answer it if it if it does ring, um, because it it means it's important if it's if it's ringing that day or if, if you're getting a text so. Um, and then you know if there is let's see here. One of the other things i'm kind of. Uh, over top of here, but um, again, with that with that uh, email template, being able to send along maps, um, anything that's going to make that that get there easier. If you're going to pick somebody up, make sure that you know you've got the car reserved. Uh, all those things that can go on a previous checklist too. Melissa, do you have anything add to add to uh, our artist stuff? I do with regards to um, content. I think especially, I think it's really important to discuss current events. And I know that's the two to four weeks. This is a two to four weeks out situation and things happen day of that you're 
I just think it's important to remember that there's no such thing as too much information. Um, and we would rather know everything than have to fill in the blanks because, um, you know, we can't leave any information up for assumption. So we obviously want physical logistics, parking passes, who to call, what's their preferred way to communicate that day of but also to let us know and let the artists know of, of nuance. We don't know if there's a song someone performs that it just would, would be seen as poor timing um, if there was a current event or something like that happening on your campus. So it's those types of things that um, they might not always be the most fun to, to, to discuss, but for the sake of clarity and making sure that you get the best performance, I just really think that's important to, to discuss current events. Even if you say, here's our campus newsletter, um, peek, peek through and um, just so that you understand kind of current events of the campus. When, when it comes to the bigger name artists, sometimes they don't know their travel till about four weeks out, sometimes two weeks out, because if they're flying in and out, they might not book their flights until then. So um, understand that sometimes they can only answer some of your questions, but that's okay. And if you if you work with a middle agent, we start that that process of asking the initial questions. You know what what are your travel plans? What kind of vehicles will you have? You know how big is your travel party? We we kind of have a an email template that we send out to the artist to kind of get some of the initial information. Uh, always ask for an updated rider when it comes to a major artist, because those can change so regularly and quickly that you want to be able to look at it and see if it's majorly different from what you contracted. And that's where you have to have those conversations of shoot, this is very different. Where can we meet in the middle and stay within our budget? So that's, again, those are where a middle agent comes in handy because they can have those difficult conversations as well. Um, but the the directions are very important because all too often college campuses have one address. <laughs> when the whole campus is the same address, it's very difficult to find where you're supposed to go. So a map or a pin or, hey, I'll, I'll text you a pin as you get close, whatever can help them get there. And again, Sue mentioned the, the cell phone number for someone. It should be a cell phone number for someone that if they're lost, <laughs> somebody can guide them in. So I, that's why, even though, even when I'm at a show, I give them, you know, the, the lead advisor or student, their cell phone number first, because if you're lost in this city, I can't help you. So I'm here if you need something else, but I have to hand the phone to someone else if they call me. So any kind of clear directions, contacts list, a timeline for the day and a bunch of notes for success. So if the, and if that's where I reiterate the content restrictions, because then it's all in that show day thing. So that if somebody forgot to reread their contract quick before running out the door, they have some of those important notes right in front of them on this, um, on an advance email or document. But at the end of the day, it, you know, artists are, are people and they often have routines, like I mentioned earlier, that keep them sane as they're traveling from city to city. So for instance, some artists for their meet and greet, they won't meet anybody until after the show because they have their pre-show routine or they, they have to be done with sound check at least three hours before their show, or they have to eat at least two hours before their show. You know, some of those, so, you know, keep in mind that those are all things that they've determined in their life are their boundaries and how they stay sane on the road. And usually there's a lot of, um, you know, nuance to that. And, and some are stuck in those routines and some are very flexible and willing to work with you. If you do have to make a change, no big deal. But those are all some of those things you can go through in the advance, like, Hey, what else is important to you? Or, you know, you can ask um, questions like that. There's even, even asking what their photo policy is. Cell phones, you're not going to restrict. Nobody's going to restrict cell phones for the most part when it comes to music performances. At least some comedians do want you to ask people to put their phones away. But for music artists, you're not going to restrict cell phones, but they often have rules against professional recording and photography devices. Like perhaps they can only take photos from the front of the, you know, right in front of the stage for the first three songs, and then they have to move behind the crowd. All of those things are important to go over so that both sides have their expectations set and you can inform your teams, your photographers, your other, other folks. So it, it you know, all of that is, um, 
important to go through so that everybody's prepped for the day of. And that doesn't mean like things won't come up on the day or if somebody gets lost and they're a little bit late because they're driving around your campus. But at least the, mo the more info you can go through in advance, the better. And um, the, the other thing I want to say about, about privacy is I always tell my teams, uh, consider, consider backstage an artist's home for the day and the, their individual dressing or green room is their bedroom. Uh, if you, if you think of it like that, you're going to be much more apt to knock, uh, just to avoid any awkward situations for both parties and also to respect their privacy treat backstage like their home. Don't have folks just taking random photos of artists backstage, you know, when they're not in full, you know, on stage apparel or whatever they want to present themselves. But it's, it's important to note that that's kind of their home away from home. And, and the, the green room is kind of like their, their bedroom for the day. Okay, well, let's talk about show day. Sue, do you want to go through some things as well? I do. Uh, excellent. So show day. Yay. Finally, we're here. Uh, make sure you're greeting your artist and you've got somebody there who is ready to receive them when they come to, uh, you know, the, the agreed upon location. Um, like Jolene was talking about low privacy if needed, uh, water is like the number one thing you can do. Give them a bottle of water, give them a, you know, mug with your logo on it, you know, whatever it is. Um, but making sure that that they're ready to 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 do an incredible show for you. It's all it's all in the in the details kind of. So make sure you're communicating um, to go off of what Melissa said. I couldn't agree with you more about um, having conversations about anything that's happened on campus in the last you know, week or two that is a, a sticking point for anybody and making sure that that uh, to no one's fault they're not, you know, it, it's not being brought up. It's not being made light. Um, you know, that we've, we've all had it happen before and it's just because that conversation wasn't had. And so I think that as you're working through all of these, um, these pieces of, of the, the show and the event on a whole, there's so many opportunities to really grow in your communication skills and everything else about having those like weird conversations maybe, but also, on the back end, you see the value that they add and how great that is. Um, make sure that the artist knows about payment. It's always more comfortable for you to talk about the payment than it is for them to have to ask for it, right? So if you have already sent the check to the agency, awesome, let them know that. If you have it and you say, hey, it's our policy, we're gonna give this to you at the end of the show, great, that's fantastic. Um, if they're doing a teaser for you, like we kind of talked to, um, make sure that you go around with them. You know, sometimes like somebody random that if it's a smaller campus that nobody knows and they're just like walking around doing magic trips in the cafeteria, that might be really awkward for everyone. But if if there's a friendly face that's going around with them and they're able to um, kind of say, oh, hey, you guys have to see this, you know, check this out or whatever it is. Um, make sure that uh, that you've got someone assigned and also that the uh, length of time that that was going to happen. So whether that be 30 minutes or 45, maybe it's an hour um, is also adhered to uh, just because, you know, again, they're on the road. You want to make it feel as homey as possible. Um, so maybe that's a, a more of a salad than an Applebee's or whatever it might be. But all of those things are are good to, to keep in mind. And then during the show, I, no matter the kind of show, um, you know, there are definitely types of shows where you have people, you know, the, the the type of event that it is that maybe it's a counselor that's on site for that if there are survivors in the audience or whatever that might be, making sure that there's a staff person on site so that if something were to happen, whether that be uh, the audience gets unruly, the performer goes rogue, the whatever happens, that there that doesn't fall on the shoulders of a student volunteer who's having to like work through the 
most traumatic situation that they could imagine for their event, right? So um, having that staff person on site is is so very important, um, even if they're just sitting doing work in the back, but um, just having that person there is definitely uh, very much uh, appreciated. <laughs> I also want to point out that if you do have a, there's often like a concert, you know, leader, whether that be a staff person or a student that really like knows the, the event in and out because they've been working on it for months. If that person can kind of be as centrally located, you know, as possible and around and then can delegate for the other things, it's, it's always, you know, I know everybody's understaffed, but if you can prevent, you know, the, the same person that knows all the details is the runner and they're constantly gone, it, it just makes your show day that much more difficult. So as much as you can delegate away from that main contact person and kind of keep them in a central hub to field all the questions and send tasks out left and right, that's going to be a good way to organize your day just so that that person is kind of the go-to. And we all know that things don't always go as planned. Melissa, do you want to <laughs> chat about that? Oh, you're muted. I pushed a button and then Zoom went away. So I'm sorry about that. Um, I wanted to add on just a couple of things. Um, let them know, and I'm, I booked a lot of comedians in my day, and some things that really help us and comedians is letting folks know about your audience. Do you have a loud laugher who comes to every single show and folks are kind of like, ugh, when that loud laugh is called out, maybe mention that so that the comedian can go not mention it at all. Things like that. So those are all really good things to, to notice. So like if everybody already knows it's going to happen, then it's a non-issue. So anything about your audience that you can let anyone know of is great. The other thing again, and again, with my comedy brain turned on um, that I, uh, in content related, you can never be too careful. Um, if a comedian says, what are the rules or, or anyone, a poet says, what are the rules? What can I discuss or not discuss? And you have an anything goes policy. I can guarantee you that anything goes to you and anything goes to the comedian or the poet are very different. So <laughs> I would spell out pretty specifically, like, I mean, they will appreciate hearing you say, you can say ass, you can say shit, but you cannot say F, right? You can, you can talk about this, 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 but you cannot talk about that. Like it might seem silly. And I always keep those, these exact moments in conversation. Like, how did you pay your bills today? Well, I talked about what words were okay. And what words, were, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's kind of, it might seem silly, but I cannot tell you how grateful I am to hear those conversations are happening. I really, really, really encourage you to do that. It's a good segue into our next part of the conversation. Um, before we begin um, talking about issues and things like that, if you're able to practice an attitude of believing that everyone is doing the best that they can with the information they were given, you, I believe, will live a happier life. Now, I think that as an event professional, sometimes that's harder to do. And I mean, just people in general, sometimes that's hard to do, but I do think that that absolutely helps in these moments. Okay. Things went south. They didn't know. And maybe it's just to get my own. It gives me that time to take that breath before you dig into solving the issues. Right. But what's important to know, um, I think, um, if, if something happens is your main goal of this event. Okay, so if the main goal of the event or the day is to make sure that your audience has a great time and that your students have a great time and they are able to connect with their, their peers and things like that, that needs to be the goal. Okay, so maybe an artist is late. Maybe, um, maybe they got stuck in a, a, a flooded road and are, are late for sound check. That is a real life scenario for me. Um, so you have to somehow think of a way to make sure that the students are still having a great time. There's only some, so many things that you can do, right? So let's figure it out. To Jolene's point, everything is figureoutable. Our main goal is to show our students a great time. Perfect. 
grab the bingo wheel, grab something going on, whatever the case may be. Uh, I know that's, I don't mean to simplify all of this by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so if it's an act of God, there's only so much you can do. Another instance, um, snowstorms, flights are delayed, things like that, that happens. Can you start your show 45 minutes later? If you can't, that's okay. That is a boundary you have to honor. Let us know. Um, but also to, to, Julian, to, to Jolene's point, they are human. They are doing everything they can to get you. Can we find some middle ground um, and to, 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 so that the show can still, still go on? Even if it's a smaller audience, can we still make something happen so that we can get everybody you know, to the end goal to have a nice time? Let's say we have just had this really beautiful content conversation and something still happens on stage. My first recommendation is to call the agent. Um, it's it's okay to call the agent um, all the time. Like if if you cannot, if you're not someone who appreciates strategic thinking in a the moment, then the answer is always call the agent and they are going to walk you through it. Um, I think it's really important to um, make sure that the agent, especially since many times your agent is not present at the shows, the agent is going to try to, um, and this is partly with my mom hat on, but we know there's three sides to every story, right? We know there's the artist side, we know there's your side, we know there's something in the middle, right? So there's something going on and we have to put all the pieces together. They might have some insight as to what is going on with the artist that might've made something, you know, go, go wrong. Um, they might have, they might be able to identify it. that was an honest mistake. You didn't know that that was the, the purpose for XYZ item on the rider. Um, it's just really important to be able to get um, your agent involved so that they can make right any conversation, any issue. You really need to make sure that what we don't do is go nuclear because it just does not help anything. We cannot find a solution when everyone is fingers to chest and raised voices. It, it doesn't work. Now, I also say this, I know many people who are those, that's how they react. They need to point fingers and yell. And if you are that person, your team probably knows already, we know to remove you from the situation and we'll handle this. You cool off, We'll, we'll, we'll get it from here, okay? So really, really, really know this about yourself and know this about your teammates so that you can say, uncle, I gotta go cool off and that is okay to do, okay? Um, but again, call the agent, work it out. If for whatever reason you feel like this is beyond repair and, and all of that, it's okay. Um, I, I Let me just make sure that I use my words correctly here. Uh, if something on stage is happening, I haven't had this happen before, fortunately, in 20 years. If something you think is beyond repair and the, the show needs to stop, you need to remove the artist from the stage, you do have the control of the soundboard where you can cut sound and, and turn off the lights. So that is something that's in, in the power as long as we know you know, that you've exhausted all of your options. And, and by then, if that is something you're doing, your agent is most definitely involved, okay? Um, but definitely look at like, okay, this is, I, I just think it's really important to assume something is going to go not according to plan. I don't want to say wrong because sometimes things get better when we have to um, get creative. Uh, I, I will occasionally even find silver lining in our, our COVID era just because of some of the things that it gave us and, and, and things like that, eternal optimist. But um, I do think it's really important to look for opportunity in those challenges and try your hardest to say, nobody wanted this to happen. This is not because, you know, try not to why me out of it and, and say, okay, the goal is to get these students a bang up op, um, opportunity and engagement because we all know that engaged students are retained students and the higher ups want to make sure that everybody feels like they're um, getting their money's worth and all of that stuff. Really, really, really make sure that you approach it with um, as calm of a mind as you can. And, and, and in your post-show evaluations, you can say this happened, allow, you know, 
allow an opportunity to to remedy things that happen. But but for sure, just get through the moment. We don't have to you know record scratch and be like, well, that's because you X Y Z or didn't X Y Z. Just get through the moment and um and 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 cool off a bit, and we can we can talk about the rest in a, in a post show evaluation. Absolutely. So again, in the interest of time, I can't believe how quickly this has all flown by, but we do have one more on measuring and assessing that I know we would love to get through. If you have to hop off, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Um, if you are able to stick around with us, uh, we are going to go through this. We will answer more questions. All of this stuff will go out to you um, via another email uh, so that you have the slides, the resources, our contact information if you need us you know we're we're here to help and and we want to see everybody win so um Jolene I will give it back to you to talk about measurement and assessment um or so Melissa, I don't I don't I'm sorry yeah, yeah. Melissa do you want to talk about how the the this relates to your rubric from the beginning first yes and I'll speed through this um because I can get long-winded so by knowing your mission and vision and um and going through your needs wants boundaries we know that a lot of events and determining a successful event either is not measurable or is somewhat counterintuitive like if you only have 10 students there but they all have like life changing experiences is that a bust or a win, right? So depending on who you're asking, it, it could be both, right? So I think it's really understanding, again, the, that mission and vision and, and really being able to justify um, your efforts to administration, okay? Um, at the end of the day, your administration wants to know that folks seen, you know, heard, loved, and valued, right? And, and and validated. So if we can do all of that, then your job is successful. There are some definite things that you can do, um, you know, in, an, in the surveys um, realm. I've worked with schools to make a belonging index survey so that they can present that to their dean and admin afterwards. Um, so they can say, not only are our events valuable, but here's how they are supporting the strategic mission of the university. If, if you know, if belonging was a was a part of their strategic um, mission in that in that for that particular institution. So I, some of those things you can really use, even if you're only having a small amount of people to your events because they've chosen one of the other 598 going on on campus, or, um, you know, it's just it, for whatever reason, you need to really show how that won. Um, so again, focus on the goal of the event, the mission of the event, and, and, and base your evaluation around that. I do think that it's important to have honest conversations throughout, um, but especially post-show. A lot of times agents don't hear how shows go um, unless there's an issue. Um, so anytime you can shoot a little even positive review to the agent, it's always it's always appreciated. It's not necessary. We understand every, everybody's busy, but it's, it's kind of fun to hear the, the wins too. Um, one thing that I encourage you to empower your students, especially to take away, is after the show, they've had a wonderful time. They say, we are definitely having you back. Um, maybe don't say that unless you mean you're having them back. <laughs> um, that is one comment I get from artists all the time. Yeah, they said they want to have me back. And then they learn like, oh, we can't have the same artist back to back, or we have to wait two years. So it ends up being kind of a longer, it's okay if they do. I mean, everybody gets excited. I was a student programmer once upon a time. So I totally, I totally understand why it happens, but encouraging um, your your team to know that folks will take everything quite literally. So um, it's okay to say great, great show. We loved it. Thanks so much. Um, but they don't have to elaborate on that unless they mean it, in which case absolutely talk to the agent. Um, like I said, just keep things really um, transparent and honest throughout. And, and again, when everything is, uh, you know, my, um, Brene Brown is a guru of mine, and she always says, clear is kind. Um, if, if nobody has to fill in the blanks and you've given all the information, then you are setting yourself up for a wonderful, smooth sailing and honest experience, okay? Um, and I think in the speed version, 
that's what I have. <laughs> And I was just going to say that uh, uh, at the end of the show, you have to pay your bills usually. Uh, if it's not on site, if you if you can have a check on site to hand to someone and you're allowed to do that and everything gets processed in time, do it. Even if they say, oh, can you mail that instead? At least you have it there and you can pop it in the mail if they if they refuse it. But that's always the you know ideal. And then if you have a net 30 or a process where you're not allowed to handle checks, that's where all of this traces back to the offer and the contract that should be spelled out somewhere. Otherwise, you're going to get a daily email from somebody looking for their payment. <laughs> so that's where you can um, kind of refer back to. Yep, net 30, it'll show up about then. Um, and we refer back to that a lot. When you don't initiate the payment process until after the show happens, sometimes things come up where, oh, the invoice didn't match the W-9, didn't match the contract. Try to try to get those things checked beforehand so that that net 30 can start right away. Because sometimes it's like, oh, it'll be net 30 once we clear up this paperwork. Well, anything you can do to get that all set up on the front end so that the net 30 initiates at the time so you can fulfill the net 30 that you promised them, great. Like, I, and I know that that's becoming harder and harder because they'll get kicked back seven offices away from you if something doesn't match. So whatever you can do to kind of know that process and what all has to match, the better. So okay. many slide options, Sue. <laughs> I, there's so many slide options. Okay, we are now taking questions, but you've seen that slide before and you haven't seen this slide. So I wanna show off a new slide. Um, so we would love to hear from you. If you have questions of us, if you want to deep dive into something, if, if you want to tell us about how cute your dog is, I don't care. Let us know. We would love to hear from you. And, uh, so this is all of our contact information. Um, and Jolene's putting her as in there as well. And then in addition, um, that little QR code is going to link to the resources. So um, the slides will be in the resource uh, folder, the marketing, Melissa's um, needs, wants, and boundaries is in there. Um, you betcha. Oops, there you go. Um, all of that is in there. And so please, please, please use it, share it, give it to new people on your team. Again, we we understand that everybody is doing all of the duties as assigned. I mean, some people here two weeks in, this is, I mean, I just, I really give you a lot of props to come out to something like this. Um, and so uh, I, I think that it's it's really great to get moving on the right foot and uh, and just being able to ask the questions and, and figure out the answers when you don't know something and nobody expects anybody to know everything. So um, giving that grace to yourself to, to know that perfection isn't, isn't the end goal here, progress is, right? So um, hopefully some of the things that we've said today uh, is helpful to you and, uh, and, and maybe clear something up in your head or uh, gives you some new ideas. I really appreciate all the commentary in the chat on uh, here's some really fun things that we've been doing and, and some of the, those conversations that were going on. So um, we're just so thrilled that you could be a part of this and uh, that we could put this on for you all. And I'll leave my my other two co-presenters to, to say their, their words. Sue kind of did a great job wrapping that up. I don't know what else to add, but uh, we we're here to help. So when you have questions, ask us. And um, the some of the comments in here are wonderful. Melissa did put the drive folder in the chat. If you're watching a recording of this, hopefully we can we can make those links accessible in the notes or something just so you have access to all of those. But ultimately, feel free to email us and ask a thousand more questions. Like that's what we're here for. And we want everybody to have a successful experience and feel like all their new people are are prepped and ready for events and to have, you know, a, a better experience and, a, and some good wins so that, um, you know, people stick around and enjoy their job a little bit more. That too. So. Melissa, do you have any last words of wisdom? You've all said it beautifully. <laughs>
Excellent. Well, thanks so much for hanging out with us for a couple hours here this afternoon and uh, take care and have a wonderful, oh, I guess I can't say weekend. In my head, it's like Thursday. Is it Thursday yet? It's not Thursday. Okay. Have a great day, everybody. And we'll talk to you all soon.